Hello again guys, welcome back to another Big Al Divling video and today I'm going to be starting a mini series that represents the um, overall, once the series is complete, the, what I hope to be the complete set of Viking mythology and stories. Now, for a lot of you, I hope, you know, I, I imagine the stories that I'll be telling you will be purely for entertainment purposes because who doesn't want to hear the stories of Thor fighting Yungamunda, the big giant world serpent that is the size of the earth itself? Uh, and things like that but also um, I will be including at the end of every video a complete analysis but, uh, of uh, information not only of my own ana analysis but from other philosophers who I will be citing, citing and referencing within the descriptions below um, a full analysis of what that story means and the hidden meanings behind it because of course um, what you've got to understand these myths and legends so to speak of the Viking era were um, not stories to the people who told them okay they were very much how um, to a lot of people in modern times uh, the Bible and the Quran and the Torah and all that uh, these weren't stories these were historical events that and that taught you had hidden meanings hidden morals and taught you how to live your life and how to see the world and interact with it. Um, to, to, to the people at the time, these stories were very, very real. I will also just say now, right from the word go, myself, I am um, myself a pagan. Um, I am of Nordic and Celtic dual heritage. So my belief set is very personal in the sense that I've merged in some ways Odinism with Celtic paganism. but I'm I'm more so than anything else like Odinism. Okay, so this is actually in theory my own belief set. Okay, um, not all of all of it. I mean, that's the, that's the thing. I'm not a fundamentalist. Uh, I'm, you know, I have a liberal attitude when I read a religion, and I can go, well, I don't agree with that part of religion, but that 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 makes sense to me. Okay, and so as I say, for me, um, uh, I am. Uh, an, Od an Odinist, uh, which means I believe in the old Viking uh, belief and religion, and I uh, am very passionately going to share it with you, and I hope you find it not only entertaining, but also educational for those who do listen to the analysis afterwards. Don't worry, I ain't, I'm not going to go on any raids anytime soon or anything like that. <laughs> Okay, so guys, the first place that we're going to start with is going to be the cosmos creation myth, because in theory that's the beginning of everything, and I'm going to try and follow it in a chronological order, okay, of this happened, then this happened, then that happened, okay, that way everything will make sense. But, because of course certain things that happen in some of the stories do have serious consequences later on. But, the problem is, the cosmos creation myth is at the beginning, because... To give you a background, and this is very much what I believe in also, the Nords, the ancient Nordic people, the Vikings if you wish, which were just a small part of the ancient Nordic people, um, they did not believe that time was linear. They didn't believe that there was a beginning and eventually over here there's an end or there's an infinite amount of progression of time. Okay, They believed instead that time was a circle. Well, it repeated itself. Oh, sorry, it didn't repeat itself, recycled itself. Because there was a beginning and there was an end at the top of the circle. And at the, at the end, essentially, there was a complete destruction of everything that had happened. But some survivors would exist. Not everything would be destroyed. And from the remnants of the destruction and all the death that, that occurred, essentially apocalypse... Um, there would be some survivors of the apocalypse. From that, there would be a new creation and then a new life until, again, apocalypse repeated itself. There's complete destruction of life almost, and then again, creation again. Okay, so that's what Vikings believed in. They believed in a circular time, essentially, which to me makes complete sense um, from a from from my perspective. Um, makes complete sense. Okay. Um, and uh, one of the, uh, that fact 
that alone will influence a lot of how they of my interpret of the a lot of the interpretations of the stories that you'll hear not just on today's video but on all the other videos you've got to remember that the fact that vikings do not believe in the cessation of time just the recycling of it instead um, and what ultimately what that represents um, and what it is is that life can't come from nothing 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 can come from nothing you know something cannot come from nothing okay there must be the destruction of someone or something to give life to something else um, and that's complete contrast to the modern religions um, of the Judaic uh, Christianic religions of, 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 of modern eras where of course during the creation myth God just created the world in seven days for example or you know, things are just pop out of nowhere so to speak and Vikings believed wholeheartedly that something if you want life you need death okay and in many ways that's why they never feared death uh, in battle okay um, but you'll understand more of what I'm going on about when I start telling you the stories you'll hear the stories you go oh i see why they why they, they they did that and hopefully my, my 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 aim is with this mini series that i'm doing is not only as i say to entertain it and to educate but also to get you behind the eyes of a viking or an ancient nordic person back you know a thousand years ago and be able to see the world through their eyes um whether you believe what they believed or not it doesn't matter but be able to see it through their eyes that's 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 being a proper historian, you know, understanding how ancient cultures existed and why they existed. Well, it's mostly because of their belief structure. Okay, they acted in certain ways because this is what they believed. Okay, so let's get straight into the story, guys. For those who want to hear it, and then we'll go into these analysis in more detail later on. When I'm telling the story, I'll expand upon certain words. Some of the words are going to be poorly pronounced. I do apologise for that. I'm an English-speaking person. Um, I don't speak Scandinavian or any any Scandinavian language, um, and I don't speak whatever ancient language of Viking spoke or anything like that. So I do apologise if any of my pronunciations are off. Um, I mean, no disrespect or anything like that. But um, I will try to. As I go on, for those of you who who have never heard any of the Viking tales before, you can quite easily get lost because there's not an explanation of what one thing is or another. Uh, I will expand as much as possible uh, without trying to slow the story down too much, um, what certain things are as we go along. Okay. So the origin of the cosmos. Before there was soil or sky or any green thing. There was only the gaping abyss of Gnunganap. Gnunganap is essentially chaos. It's the void. It's nothingness. It's the thing that the Vikings could not understand and believe that can't exist. But they believed that obviously it existed to some degree before creation. Okay. So before there was soil or sky or any green thing, there was only the gaping abyss of Gnunganap. This chaos of perfect silence and darkness, as it's described, lay between the homeland of elemental fire, Muselheim, and the homeland of elemental ice, Niflheim. Frost from Niflheim and the billowing flames from Muselheim crept towards each other until they met in the middle of Gnognap. Amid the hissing and the spluttering, with the fire might melting the ice and the ice putting out the fires. The fire melted the ice and the drops of water formed themselves into the very first creation, Emir, the godlike giant. Now Emir was the very first life form to exist within all of creation and he was a giant. Now one thing I will say now giant in for the ancient nordic people didn't necessarily just mean big it could mean big a lot of giants were very big and emir was the biggest of the lot he was massive he was huge he was the biggest creature to ever exist okay um but there are, but 
on the whole, the giants were just another godlike species because um, the, obviously the Vikings had a polytheistic religion. They believed in a lot of different gods and a lot of their gods came from different tribes. Okay, just like humans come from different lands or different tribes like they did at that point. Um, uh, the gods were the same. They were no different. They were different races and, and of gods. Um, and giants were just a race of gods. Okay, and the giants weren't always big. They were actually on the most part human size or the same size as the other gods. Um, but what they did have was a particular affinity for, for a type of magic that would allow them to transform their shape and size. Okay, So they were very good with magic, typically, and they could use that magic to change their appearance. And they often, for some reason, liked to turn into things like giant eels and things like that. Okay, But they could change their physical appearance into that of a more human-like size creature and stuff like this. Now, their original form, as I say, was probably human size anyway. But obviously, if they wanted to appear to be a big, gigantic creature like a titan from the Greek uh, myths and legends, ancient Greek myths and legends, then they could do that. A lot of them could do that. They were capable of doing it because of their magic. But they weren't necessarily born that way. Emir was an exception. He was huge. Bigger than huge. He was, I mean, like, he was as big as you get. Okay? Now... Amir was actually hermaphrodite, <laughs> believe it or not. He had both male and sex, uh, female sexual uh, genitalia and could reproduce asexually. Where, uh, and he did it when he sweated. And from his sweat, the giants were born. Okay, so the race of giants, which were gods, um, that lived within the realm of Niflheim, that is the realm of ice, uh, typically, um, they... Um, were actually born of the sweat of their 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 or originator um, Emir. Okay. How, however, Emir was formed from both fire and ice, and anything that was formed, even just in the slightest, by fire, had the capacity for evil. Ice was pure, and anything that was made of pure ice with no fire influence whatsoever, was bound to be good. It had a good spirit, a good soul, so to speak. It was, um, it would always attempt the person or the whatever it would be, it would always try to do good things, generally speaking. Anything that was made out of, out of, out of the realm of fire was pure evil. And anything that was a mixture of both water and, oh, sorry, of ice and fire had capacity for both good and evil but there was always that evil lurking in the background and the more fire that was within it the more evil there was going to be and Emir was particularly he was kind of an evil creature he became jealous of more beautiful beings that came after him uh, more powerful beings in many respects that came after him um, and these more powerful beings came from the frost because as the frost continued to melt there was a cow called Ord Humbler that emerged from it and the cow I mean it's a silly childlike concept in my opinion but the cow ultimately represents essentially almost like the Holy Ghost within Christianity it's just a spirit of life because it went around and it found and created all the other life forms that or, or all the other gods ultimately nourished them okay with its milk and it freed them from the ice by licking them out of the ice see it, it seems a little silly but ultimately that's what it is it's just essentially a life force it had no real motive other than simple creation okay um and Ord Humbler even nourished Ymir the big giant that was formed from the two, Niflheim and um, uh, Muselheim, come together, the two realms come together, even nourished Emir with her milk. And she, in turn, was nourished by licking the salts out of the ice. Um, as she licked the ice, she slowly uncovered, as I said earlier, 
other creatures, other creations, so to speak. Uh, and the very first one that she uncovered was Buri. He was the first of the Aesir tribe of gods. Now, the Aesir tribe of gods are the Asgardians, ultimately. Therefore, he was Aesir. Um, uh, Odin, he was Aesir. Okay, so the first tribe of gods to be founded um, was uh, was uh, uh, essentially the Aesir, and it was with the, the god uh, Buri. Okay, Buri then had a son named Bor, who married Bestla. Bestla was the daughter of the giant Bolthorn. Okay, so the Aesir had no problem there was no racism as such the giants they had no no issues with the giants at this point in time and they were would intermarry between them and have children and so um uh the aesir mixed their bloodline very quickly with the giants okay um and the um the product of bestler and Bor, Bor being the Aesir, Bestler being the giant, was the half god, half giant children, Odin, Vili, and Ve. So Odin himself, which is a not a well known fact, Odin himself was half giant. So he was, bear in mind, his grandfather, um, Buri, was of pure ice. He was a creature pure goodness he had no evil in him same as his son Bor had no evil but Odin did have the blood of giants flowing through him and because giants came from Amir who came from both ice and fire Odin did have the capacity for evil within him if he if he if he needed it he was partially corrupted by the fire of Niflheim okay and it's an interesting thing to know. I mean, he was actually a very good god, but a very wise god. But that would be po probably one of the reasons why he was quite fond of violence as a solution um, to solve a lot of his problems. Okay. Um, whereas his grandfather would probably never use violence as a solution. He'd always use diplomacy where, where, where best. Okay. Now, Odin and his brothers, and this is their first... You could consider evil act for some reason had had i don't know the reason why but amir was as i say getting jealous of odin odin was and the other aesir they they were they were powerful beings they were beautiful whereas amir was ugly and mon monstrous and i think he caused them trouble he was he was awkward with them um and so odin and his brothers kind of in my opinion overreacted they fought Emir and slew him. They killed Emir, the very first life form to ever be created. And they did this with complete brutality to the point where they then decided that they would desecrate his corpse and use that death of Emir to create, okay, to create new life, okay. Um, and so they set about constructing the world that men would live within Midgard essentially so they created a world from Emir that's how big he was you can create an entire world out of him and so they used um, the, his blood to create the oceans of our world the soil was created from his skin and the muscles and it's the vegetation that grew from that soil was his hair the clouds that float above us are his brains and the sky itself was his skull and that skull was held at the four cardinal points that's north east south and west by four dwarfs a dwarf at each cardinal point and in doing so midgard was created and the gods formed the very first man and woman who were named ast ask and embla and they created them from two tree trunks so men come from trees ultimately okay and they build a fence around Midgard to protect us from the giants who hated us because even though we were in many ways the product of uh, their own uh, father, we were represent 
representative representative of the death of their father also and that's why giants didn't tend to get on quite well with men okay and it's why the giants didn't like the ASM more more importantly and it's why they constantly strived to bring around Ragnarok they wanted revenge for the death of their forefather okay now there are three conceptual meanings embedded within the story that I've just told you so if you enjoyed the story thank you and that's all you want to listen to thank you you feel free to tune off you've listened for long enough 20 minutes is long enough to listen to me but if you want to listen now to the analysis, there are three conceptual meanings that are embedded behind this myth that you've got to understand to understand how a Viking or a Nordic person of that period in time would see the world, interact with the world, and how it would change the way that they would they would uh, live their lives. Okay, um, and it would just give us a general insight into their philosophy and the philosophy of someone like myself who who, who does um, follow in many ways. Um, what, what, what is what I'm about to discuss okay now the first of it is that creation never occurs in vacuum okay um, it necessitates instead the destruction of what which of what came before it new life feeds on death a principle which is recapitated every time we come to eat we must kill an animal to feed ourselves. And that is one of the ways in which the Vikings, because obviously they didn't understand proteins, carbohydrates, and all the rest of it, but it's one of the reasons why Vikings understood why they needed to eat. They needed to sustain their life by killing death fed life. Okay, and that this was one of the ways that they explained it was the creation within their creation. If you can see, death all around has given so much creation, so there's no issue in killing something to sustain your own life because it's only natural. Okay, despite and this this was quite a big thing for Vikings and in, in, in this, any Celtic, Celtic paganist, for example, who's listening to this will understand very much so. Um, Vikings had a very similar view to the Celtic Paganists um, that everything in the world had some kind of life that was connected to them. All life was connected. And so every time you cut down a tree, you were killing something. They were aware of that. And they, 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 they didn't see the world full of inanimate objects as we do today you know if we cut down a tree we just say well we cut down a tree we know it's a living plant but it's still an inanimate object there's no personification of that tree you know there's no human like qualities to it to some degree whereas the vikings would have would have looked at that tree and possibly seen an ancestor as or, you know being part of it to some degree i mean it was more celtic that saw it like that uh, the spirits of gods and the spirits of ancestors lived within streams and trees and stuff like that. But the Vikings had a similar outlook on life. They didn't like to kill for the sake of it. They only killed so they could create instead. So they weren't as barbaric as people think. Because, they, 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 you know, when you see the world as full of life. Life that is yours as well as theirs. I mean, it, it, it makes things more sacred. The world becomes much more of a sacred place to live on. Okay? Now, this constant give and take is one of the most basic principles of life. And it features prominently within North, within the Norse creation myth that I've just read to you. Okay? Um, the world, essentially, was not created ex nihilo. Okay? Out of nothing, as it is within the Judeo-Christian creation myth. Um... Rather, in order to create the world, the gods first had to slay a giant, Emir, okay? And the rep uh, who, within this story, within the creation myth, Emir rep represented the primal chaos whose indifferentiated state is shown as him being a, ma a hermaphrodite um, is, a, is essentially an extension of Gunungunak himself itself and that's why he was destroyed because the vikings 
cannot handle in any way whatsoever this this void of silence, this void of nothingness. They don't understand it. And because he was created within the void between the two realms and is almost representative of it, as I say, as a, because he was hermaphrodite, he was undifferentiated. He had no real um, personality in that sense. It's why Odin and William Vey, his two brothers, had no real moral decisions when it came to destroying Kim. He represented chaos. And it's also why the giants within Viking mythology always represent, in many ways, chaos and its, the, 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 and its random destruction. Um, and it's why they, the giant characters, well, the race of giants, were picked uh, within Viking mythology as the ones who would always try and strive to bring about round Rag Ragnarok, the destruction of the world and the bringing back of chaos and Ganunganap back into the world um, until life again found a way to blossom back from its destruction. Um, and that is an explanation as to why the giants are essentially the bad guys. Um, but bear in mind, you know... Um, there has to be death for there to be life. So, are they the bad guys? No, they're just a necessity. They're just a way of the Vikings seeing that the world is cruel. The world is destructive, especially back then, with lots of you know ch ch children would die young, and you know men and women wouldn't, wouldn't live very long typically and it was a barbaric world and if you were viking you would go around killing a lot of people and stuff and you would drown at sea possibly and you would starve in the winter and things like that it made more sense to them to understand this this cruelness of the world um, as being almost the product of the giants trying to bring about um, Ragnarok again okay now the other concept to to, to, to discuss that is represented within this uh, uh, story is the idea of flesh and matter. In the modern world, we view the physical universe as consisting as mostly inert, essential, essentially mechanical matter. Okay, um, even the trees, for example, we can turn them into buildings, even though we know they're living matter. We can turn them into the wardrobe. I've got a, I've got a door behind me, and made out of wood. I don't see that ultimately is a living thing um, and that's because of my modern upbringing it's, it, it came from a tree that was living but it's now inert okay um, and that's the world that we live in and this view can be traced back to one of two sources the first of course is the Christian or Judaic Christian Islamic creation myth where the monotheistic God fashions the world as a mere artifact into which the divine substance never really enters. Now, Jesus obviously enters the world, but 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 ultimately, God as Himself has never come down to earth. He's never become, you know, a massive element of our planet. He came down as possibly a man for a short period of time, but but. Um, Otherwise, the world is simply an artifact in which we dwell, and he does not. Okay. Um, the second source is the more theological uh, speculations of the ancient Greek philosopher Aristotle, who hypothesized that the world was created by the coming together of two wholly different principles of matter. Okay. That was the matter itself, it, which is the inert physical substance, and the form. Uh, which Aristotle, Aristotle uh, refers to as the unmoved mover, by which he actually means God, essentially, uh, at that point. Um, uh, the one who forms matter, but him who, who, who himself was never formed, is how he worded it, worded it. But Aristotle, the unmoved mover, provided him with a grand first cause because of course even in today's world the big even with the big bang theory um what caused the big bang there's always that first cause what created the universe what led to the very first action in the universe even with 
all the theories that we have and the science that we have today it's still largely unanswered and because the big bang of course happened i think a billionth of the second into the existence of the universe so what happened in the first billionth of the second you know what i mean it's 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 one of those that you can't really answer at this point in time maybe in the future we will be able to answer it and then this will all be just simply child stories you know um but that but that first cause the unmoved mover as i say for aristotle was what gave him the the, the ability to describe much of the physical worlds in terms of linear deterministic cause of uh, well, deterministic cause and effect essentially uh, which is then became a precursor to our own modern concept of natural laws so for him he believed that there was a physical matter and there was an unmoved mover there was this force you know which is to us would be like the strong nuclear force or you know literally application of physical force or whatever and if you do something to something there's always always a reaction and essentially that's how he was trying to work it out but he he believed that it was God or or something like a God that was um, not part of this world um, that was influencing it but never involved itself directly within the world itself um, we're getting heavy aren't we but nonetheless I hope you're enjoying the discussion now the view of the physical world as an inert non-spiritual one like I've just described like the one we all know we're all, we're all modern men and women we all live in 2017, 18, whatever it is now, 2018. That's my amnesia coming out. I don't know what year it is, but we all live in 2018, okay? And so, consequently, um, we all have a very similar outlook on this world because we've all been shaped by the same world that we all live in. And that is that the world is essentially, on the whole... An inert, 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 an inert non-spiritual one where the, if we do believe in spirits or gods the gods are separate from us and don't live amongst us like the old religions would say they do okay um, but this is a young innovation it's only been really, really been sort of around for the last two and a half thousand years that's a long time but when you consider that our species homo sapiens being around as modern man you know where we at a level where we can understand religion and probably do I mean, have been practicing religion, we bury our dead and all that for at least 150,000 years. Um, that two and a half thousand years seems like a blink of an eye, really. And within those 150, well, within those 147,500 years prior to to our modern outlook, um, humans saw the world in a much more different way. And what we do um, in a way much more like the Norse did for example and the ancient Celts and pagans did for example um, they held a very different view of the physical world itself the overwhelming majority of humans um, saw the world instead as an organic manifestation of spirit so everything is just a manifestation of spirit spirits or the spirit realms or the divine or whatever could physically manifest itself into the world itself just like the Nords believed that this world was the corpse of a giant a god we lived on a god that's the divine we're living on the divine we've got direct interaction with the divine here and there bang straight away the food that we eat the vegetation that grows out of the soil is is the hair of a god you know and stuff like this right so um you can see how organic the world becomes at this point and how spiritual every element of the world becomes at this point even the rocks the inert rocks to us you know no one would believe a rock to be living these days really but to put to, to ancient cultures they were they were they were they were a manifestation of some form of spirit or another okay um and they believed that that the world almost had a consciousness with intrinsic properties um rather than in the, uh, and this perspective is called animism you might have heard of that term animism 
and it comes from Latin. Uh, hang on, I'm, I'm, I'm misreading my notes here, so just give me one second. I do apologise. Um, but yeah, anyways, the, the perception is called animism, and Latin, the word matter, comes come, comes from the uh, Latin word which means mother, and references this very archaic viewpoint on the world and um, for example you know mother earth and so we say the word matter today and to us it means a very almost inorganic substance it means an atom it means a nu nuclear so it means you know a wardrobe or whatever a physical matter okay um, but in latin it, in, in its origins it means mother mother earth if you wish um and so it represents that very archaic outlook that men used to have in in, in ancient culture okay uh, and so we see we see references to that even in today's world and the way that we speak we just you just don't know the origins of the words so we don't really notice it as such now the norse creation myth contains nothing like a like the monotheistic god uh, or an unmoved mover even in Niflheim and Muselheim are largely the byproduct of the interactions with the other seven of the nine worlds because you could say well hang on a minute at the Nordic creation myth there are two realms that always exist at the beginning but they are simply the byproduct of Ragnarok they, they are the what is fire and ice is always what you can't is always the sort of the elements that survive destruction so to speak um, and from them comes creation again once they mix and merge again once more okay um, so this cyclical nature represents as I say this more organic world that we live in um, according to a Viking perspective okay now the third concept is the ongoing and participatory um, genesis essentially um, in the view of Aristotle and the authors and the other author and the other authors of Genesis sorry and the uh, the authors of Genesis oh, Aristotle had nothing to do with Genesis sorry in the view of Aristotle and the authors of Genesis creation was an event that happened only once and at a very specific time in the past and is now forever over it, it happened it stopped world is created that's it creation is 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 all all over and done with um in the norse perspective however creation is an ongoing and participatory process because of the circle what you do shapes the world around you, your actions, your events that you cause and are involved in, help shape the world around you, shape the people around you. And because the world is very organic, you're shaping literally even the gods themselves in many ways. And when Ragnarok comes and that's all recycled, what your effect has had in that world is then propagated into the next world, into the next living or next cycle of life ultimately so there is always with 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 the nordic perspective that creation is still happening and you are part of it and that's a very alien concept to a lot of people because we even myself in many respects believe that, yeah the world has been created it's over now but no it's not it continually evolves and we're part of that process all of us okay and everything around us is also part of that process the way the trees blow in the wind part of that process if a leaf comes off the branch part of the process it's shaped the, the whole world is shaped as we go on um, and the whole universe as a whole is shaped as we go on obviously we can only affect really the world that we live on here at this point in time and because of obviously science we are now aware there are worlds way beyond our own there is the universe and everything like that so our effect seems a lot less minor than it did 
obviously back then then there was only one world but uh, nonetheless it's an interesting and I think an array, a beautiful concept to have that you are always it makes you more important you are part of creation just as much as you know the very beginning of it okay anyway guys that's my interpretation and that's the story of the cosmos of the creation of cosmos for vikings i hope you enjoyed it um it get got it gets heavy at the end and i may have lost you at certain points if you need me to, to elaborate or um re-describe what i've said there because i've got lost in my own words then please feel free to put that in the comment section if you feel like i'm wrong in any way please put it in the description uh sorry in the in the, in the comments below as well um i'm more than happy to have debates on on this and that and whatever uh and and um it, it makes it very interesting to have a community here on youtube it makes the video more alive okay um Thank you very much guys for watching if you're still here and I will see you soon with um, another story. I don't know which one it is yet. <laughs> I can't believe it's taking 40 minutes. I thought it would take 15 minutes. My food's downstairs. See you soon.